PA. Now, Adam Sterling on CFAX 1070. On the show earlier this week, we spoke with an individual by the name of Dr. Vanessa Bursick. She was speaking about a lawsuit against what she called Canadian Medicare that comes up September the 6th at BC Supreme Court. Now, during that segment, uh, we talked about a number of issues about this. And uh, one of the people who called in said, have you interviewed the doctor behind this, Dr. Brian Day? And at the time, I said, yeah, we, we've interviewed him in the past. Dr. Brian Day, obviously a well-known advocate for privatization in the province of British Columbia has been for any number of years. But it dawned on me that um, this was actually in my previous life as a talk show host when I used to do afternoons between 2009 and 2012. And it's actually been years since I personally interviewed Dr. Day. So we wanted to bring Dr. Day on for the sake of balance and for the sake of getting both sides of this story as we move forward. Dr. Brian Day joining us on the phone line now. He's with the Canby Surgery Center. He's also the plaintiff in this case that will be going to BC Supreme Court September the 6th. Dr. Day, thanks so much. It's been too long. How are you, sir? I'm fine, Adam, and thanks for the opportunity to correct some of the um, false assertions that were made by Dr. Bursic, because uh, I think your listeners uh, need to hear the truth. Absolutely. So so you've listened to the interview that we did with Dr. Bursic. Oh, wh- what is it that, that, that she said that you feel was particularly unfair, sir? Well, I think we'll take that. We, we don't want to spend the whole um, time on, on that, but, but just a, a, a quick correction. Yes. I am not a plaintiff in this case. Um, okay. The, there, there were, and, and this is something that you wouldn't have heard from um, Dr. Uh, Bersic, uh, is that there were six patient plaintiffs and our clinic was backing them up. And the um, two of those patients, uh, cancer patients, have s- sadly have died during the eight year, almost eight years it's taken to get to trial. Oh dear. And three of the remaining ones are children, uh, one of whom is paralyzed for life after a 27-month wait to get into BC Children's Hospital for surgery on a, a, a severe spinal deformity. And of course, Dr. Bursic doesn't want to go there on, mm. on, in, 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 in pointing out that there are 2 million Canadians suffering on wait lists. I am not uh, an advocate for privatization of the health system. I want to improve Medicare, mm-hmm. and that's why our, our, our lawsuit on behalf of patients and including patients is about mo- having our system transformed into a system such as exists in most developed countries around the world, um, Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Belgium, these are countries with social programs that um, that have universal health care. They don't have wait lists, so rich or poor, there are no wait lists to jump, mm-hmm. and um, and they have hybrid systems. So so that's what our goal is, and of course, uh, as, as has been alluded to, this has already been through to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, in in um, in in Quebec. And the Supreme Court of Canada um, looked at the evidence, uh, stated that Canadians were suffering and dying on wait lists within the province of Quebec, and struck down the very, very same types of law that we're seeking to have struck down in British Columbia. And then finally, the assertion that we want to build the government unlimited amounts is absolutely false. We don't want, we don't want, and, and patient, we don't expect our patients to be building the government for anything if they have um, the same kind of private health insurance that um, that exists in in those European countries and. Um, yeah, as you, you know, 70% of Canadians already have private health insurance, but it just is not allowed to cover um, the types of services that are carried out in, in hospitals. Now, talk about the, the issue to do with, with who pays for services such as this, because that was something else that, that Dr. Bursic brought up, the idea of whether or not somebody who pays a fee for a private service should also be eligible for funds from MSP to pay for their procedure. How does that work? Well, well here, the, the, there are two components to your medical plan uh, in, in, as, as, a, as, a, as a Canadian. One is the hospital cost, and the other is the physician fee. And there is the, 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 um, the physician component of the fee is covered through your medical services plan insurance. The hospital component is covered through a global budget that the government gives to, to the hospitals. And our intent, um, um, in, co- uh, in contrast to that which Dr. Bursick um, outlined, is to have 
the the whole amount completely um, funded through uh, private insurance in the same way as already exists in British Columbia with workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. Workers' compensation, you know, people think of it as a quasi-government body. But, um, and by the way, that's the commonest type of patient we treat at our clinic. The Workers' Compensation Board gets no government funding. It's a private insurance company for people injured on the job funded by employers. So that is, so that was another um, uh, falsehood. And, and and the other thing that was kind of irk, irksome to me mm-hmm. was the the notion that we would draw doctors from the public system. The biggest wait lists in Canada right now are in my specialty of orthopedic surgery. But because there is, the hospitals are rationing operating room time, there are 178 recently graduated orthopedic surgeons in Canada who cannot get, get full-time work. Really? I had no yeah, idea. I know, but this, this is the kind of information that will come out at trial. And rather than the kind of rhetorical um, nonsense that Dr. Bursick was outlining, this is why we have gone to a judge we, uh, and the courts, because the, before the courts... Um, decisions will be made based on evidence and facts and data from around the world. And mm. the, the, this, 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 uh, Dr. Bersig also alluded to the Canadian Medical Association, and, and the Minister Philpott was there last week. She stood on the podium and admitted that our health system was, out of um, a, a recent ranking of 11 developed countries, was ranked 10th out of 11. And when asked what she could do about it, her response was, well, you know, I'm only one of 14 health ministers in Canada. I'm going to have to meet with the others and discuss what we can do. Well, you know, that's, to my mind, it, it, we, we know what to do. We need to, to look at those countries that are doing better than us mm-hmm. and not, not the United States, which is actually, was actually 11th, one below us. Yes. And if, you, if you're in a hockey league with 11 teams and you want to get better and you're the 10th team, you don't look at what the 11th team is doing. How do we avoid going the route of that 11th team then? Because uh, the, the fear is, is that the precedence that would be set through this, this legal action that is being brought on behalf of these eight, eight plaintiffs that you mentioned, how do we avoid going the way of the United States? How do we specifically not go that direction? Well, first of all, we, want, we have universal health care, which the United States doesn't, mm. but so does every other country in, that I've, you know, the yes. countries like Germany and Belgium and Switzerland and France and, and England and uh, so on, they have universal health care. Mm. That's what we um, want. But the trouble right now is, uh, is that patients are not getting access. And the evidence from around the world shows that a government, uh, a government monopoly in health care, which Canada has, is, is not the answer. And the answer lies in looking at countries like um, like Germany and Belgium. And, and, you know, one of the things I I just mentioned, we have 14 ministers of health in Canada, and each of them has a ministry. Well, and you mentioned, yeah, we've already had a case similar to this in Quebec. Well, two two points about about that. We are we are really going to the Supreme Court to the Supreme Court of British Columbia initially, but it may go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Yes. And we're asking: Should a patient suffering on a wait list in British Columbia have the same protection under the Charter of Rights that the Supreme Court of Canada gave to Quebec citizens? That that's a, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Yes. We're asking: um, What is is it appropriate? That um, that patients should be, and they, this is the words. These are the words of the Supreme Court of Canada. Is it appropriate that Canadians should be suffering and dying on wait lists? And and the the, the Supreme Court of Canada said that um, that uh, absolutely not. It's uh, the government cannot have it both ways. You cannot promise health care, then fail to deliver it, mm-hmm. and then tell a citizen that by the way. We aren't going to let you do anything about this. What we're we're fighting for is the same privileges that Quebecers have. And and finally, this is also Canadian Medical Association policy. This lawsuit is about putting, uh, Dr. Bersick alluded to the Canadian Medical Association, this lawsuit is about putting into um, law Canadian Medical Association 
policy um, af- which was based on what happened in in Quebec and and um, supported by the way by um, by over 60% of Canadians and by 80, over 80% of doctors across the country. He says he wants to bring us more in line with countries such as Great Britain that have a robust public health care system, the National Health Care Service, as well as a private component to eliminate waiting lists in this country. He says he believes it is unconstitutional for Canadians to be forced to suffer and in many cases die on waiting lists. He is Dr. Brian Day of the Canby Surgery Centre. He's a number of plaintiffs are going forward in B.C. Supreme Court. Dr. Day, you mentioned that you are not a plaintiff, but you are are leading this this group of patients, two of whom have already died, one of whom a child uh, grievously injured by dealing with cancer on a waiting list. We'll take a quick break, return to the conversation in just a moment here on CFAX 1070. Your calls, your questions, your comments are welcome at 250-386-1161 star 1070. We'll be back in just a moment. It's a lawsuit that goes to B.C. Supreme Court starting September the 6th. We've seen opponents, including members of the B.C. Health Coalition. We had a guest on earlier this week, Dr. Bursick, saying they were concerned that the ramifications of this could lead to a U.S.-style system. They said they were concerned it would allow private health care providers to charge unlimited amounts for services. Not so, says Dr. Brian Day of the Canby Surgery Centre for the last eight years as this case wound its way through the legal system. He says of the eight plaintiffs originally involved, Dr. Day, two of them have died, one of them a child grievously wounded. That's, that's tragic to hear. Yeah, I mean, actually, it was a, 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 a um, no. The the child didn't die. The child oh. is paralyzed for life. Yeah, is, the, is, the, yeah, the, grievously the, wounded yeah, by the cancer. Yes, the, the two the two um, the two um, paint, the painters that died were, were patients who who suffered on wait lists and, and had their cancers um, spread as, as a result. Mm. And and there, you know, there are many thousand. Uh, actually, in a survey of doctors carried out across the country, more than a quarter of of Physicians have had a patient in Canada die while on a wait list. Wow. So this is not, uh, I mean, and, and as you know, this is not just about um, procedures. There are over 4,000 suicides, about 4,000 suicides a year in Canada, and many of their, those lives could be saved if it were not for the poor access to, to mental health services in this country. Yes. Um, we, we talk about wait lists to see to, to get surgery or to get into hospital, but wait lists for mental health um, treatment are, are sadly lacking as well. Is is that really the same sorts of thing? Because I was under the impression that... Uh, oh, actually, no, I guess um, I'm trying to figure out... How are psychiatrists funded? Is it like medical doctors? Or? Yes, yeah, they are, they okay. are physicians who specialize in, in taking four or five years of extra training. Yes. And, um, and there, just aren't, there just aren't enough of them, and there just aren't the, the wait lists... Of uh, to see a psychiatrist, or, 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 or as long as to see any, any other any yeah. other specialist. We, yeah, I've heard that. We, the the other point that's often lost is that the worst access problems in Canada, and the, the those with the poorest health outcomes, are in the lower socioeconomic groups. So the system we have is so is not providing what. It was its an original intent was, and and what we're trying to do is create what the Canadian Medical Association calls Medicare Plus, where where it's actually better than Medicare. It makes no sense that we don't provide drug coverage, for instance. It makes no sense that we don't provide dental coverage and coverage for physiotherapy, all of which are covered in uh, those countries that I mentioned earlier that have hybrid systems. One of the things that that we find the most morally offensive about the idea of a private system is that when those scarce resources, and I mentioned this to Dr. Bursick as well, is that there are scarce resources in the medical system. There's only so many doctors out there. There are only so many hours out there. And we always imagine the worst case scenario of the poor person being denied the treatment that they need and dying because they are poor. And we find that scarcity to be morally offensive. However, as, as you've mentioned today, we don't often think about the fact that there is still scarcity and there are still people being denied the treatment that they need and indeed in some cases dying with the system that we have. And I think part of the problem is, is we don't like to admit to ourselves how bad things can be right now when we fear change. 
Well, that's right. I mean, but we were ranked, and as uh, Minister yeah. Philpott wrote, tenth of eleven. We were ranked tenth yeah. out of eleven. Uh, world Health Organization ranked us thirtieth in the world, but in the top three or four in cost. And, and then a European group um, called the European Consumer Powerhouse they compared Canada to twenty-nine countries in Europe that have universal health care, and we came out ranked twenty-third out of thirty. In overall in quality and last in value for money because we're we're spending a lot to get to get little and um, and that has to change and the result a lot of our funding um, that um, we, we in healthcare is going into a massive health bureaucracy with 14 ministers of health we have one we have 11 public health bureaucrats for every one on a com- per capita basis that Germany has, hmm. and Germany has no wait list. Interesting. Dr. Day, what do we expect the timeline to be? As you mentioned off the top, this is a long time coming. It's been, what, eight years now since this was first working its way through the legal processes. Uh, trial starts September the 6th. What happens after that? Well, it's supposed to be scheduled as, for as long as six months, and um, and there are over 200 witnesses being called. Um, um, as I said we're hopeful that um, that when objective evidence is put before the courts, it will it, um, common sense will prevail. And I think that um, that th- there are it is possible that it could be appealed either way, mm-hmm. but hopefully there will just be a definitive judgment um, in BC. But it could go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, as you There's said. There's a good possibility, yes. What would happen if you won? Well, if we win, then things like, for instance, your disability insurance. Um, right now, if you're injured in, at work, you are covered. You yes. get an MRI right away if you need it, surgery right away, procedures right away. But if you're injured and not at work, um, and, and, and even if you have disability insurance for your work, that disability insurer is not allowed to fund your health care. And um, so we're talking here about uh, someone who has the same injury um, on the weekend in the backyard as they have at work, has to, might have to wait 18 months. That disability insurer might be paying six or $7,000 or more a month in wage losses when they could spend um, $5,000 or less and get you back at work in a month or two. So they're, they're spending... Um, perhaps a hundred thousand dollars when they could spend five thousand dollars in the work and that's why WorkSafe BC um, expedites healthcare but mm-hmm. the big winner in this will be the public health system public hospitals will be able to as they do in Europe um, take in patients with disability insurance and instead of closing at four o'clock in the afternoon closing in evenings and closing on weekends they'll be op- able to open Dr. Brian Day joining us on the phone line talking about privatization of some services here in Canada. He says he does not want to go to a medical system. They are 11th out of the 11 countries put forward at a recent conference of the Canadian Medical Association. We're number 10. We have lots of room to improve. Uh, Dr. Day, thanks so much for coming on the show. Any final thoughts? No, I just um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to your listeners. Absolutely. We want to get all sides of the story, sir. We'll continue to follow this. Thanks, Adam. Take care. Bye-bye. I'm Adam Sterling.